Welcome to the podium, um, Professor William Julius Wilson, Distinguished Professor of Sociology. Uh, thank you. So I'm ple pleased to have the, the honor of introducing Jackie, who really needs no introduction, but there may be some people here who are not uh, Du Bois fellows. Uh, Jacqueline C. Rivers. Uh, Jackie holds uh, a PhD from Harvard University, where she was a doctoral fellow in the multidisciplinary program in inequality and social policy. And she was a graduate uh, research fellow of the National Science uh, uh, Foundation. Uh, I should point out that Jackie also received uh, a Harvard AB degree, summa cum laude, and Phi Beta Kappa, by the way, uh, as well as uh, two Harvard uh, MA degrees, one in psychology and one in sociology. Now, she has served as a lecturer at uh, Harvard University and has uh, presented papers at uh, the University of Pennsylvania, uh, the American Enterprise Institute, um, the University of Notre Dame, uh, University of Pennsylvania, uh, the Vatican, uh, the United Nations, and in several other uh, venues. Uh, her latest uh, publication, uh, co-authored with uh, Harvard sociologist uh, Orlando Patterson, uh, appears in the volume, The, the Cultural Matrix, uh, Understanding uh, Black Youth, edited by uh, Orlando Patterson and Ethan uh, Fossey. Uh, as, a, as a member, since I'm a member of both uh, the Department of Sociology and the Department of African and African American uh, studies at Harvard, one of the things that uh, uh, I distinctly uh, remember about Jackie uh, was that she was a student leader uh, in both departments. Uh, when Jackie spoke, her fellow graduate students listened. And I wouldn't be surprised to learn that she commands uh, the same degree of attention from the W.E.B. Du Bois fellows at the Hutchins Center. And I'm pleased to welcome her. Her talk today is Resistance to the Reproduction of Racial Inferiority. Thank you, Bill. Thank you so very much, Bill. Very kind of you, and it's a pleasure to be here with all of you. Uh, I guess the one thing that my resume doesn't talk about or my CV is my activism. And I've been, as Bill well knows, a community activist for a long time. And so I, one of my interests has been, ongoing interests has been education. So my talk today was really uh, in part grounded in that. It was going to be about academic socialization and racial socialization. But uh, I've been thinking through a different theme that emerges in the research that I did, and that's really how parents are resisting the imposition of notions of racial inferiority. And so with the kind permission of Krishna, I've actually switched topics, but it's uh, closely related to what I had intended to talk about. This is really, though, uh, in the early stages of development. So it's very rough and ready, forgive me. Um, and what I would ask is really to hear from you what you think about these developing ideas, in particular the theoretical frame. So the focus of what I'm really going to talk about is how I'm thinking of framing this. And I do give some sense of the data, but um, there is not a lot of data presented today. So please bear with me. <laughs> 
like we'll have to solve that one. Can I read those? Okay, great. So I mentioned that this is under development, developing this theoretical frame for this idea of resistance to the reproduction of racial inferiority. There are preliminary data. And I wanted to say a little bit about why I think this might be interesting. It's interesting because for us to really have any kind of uh, progress in terms of reducing this structure, the racialized structure that is not just present in the United States, but in fact prevalent in most countries, we have to first think differently. Free your mind and your feet will follow, right? So we have to think about rejecting notions of racial inferiority because it's fundamental to rejecting racism. And in fact, it's the work, it, it's the basis on which all kinds of anti-racism work is founded. That we have rejected uh, ideas about racial inferiority from the work of black abolitionists to Black Lives Matter. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the purpose, uh, give you a quick summary of the findings, look at the uh, theoretical frame in some detail talking about what this idea of reproducing nation, uh, notions of racial fear, inferiority, where it comes from. But most of the focus is going to be on the idea of resistance, the theory of everyday resistance, and how racial socialization, what parents do with academics, how that's a form of everyday resistance. Quick uh, in data, quick information about the methods and some preliminary findings, and then the conclusion. So I want, to really examining parallels between everyday ra resistance and racial socialization. And to do it, I'm looking at middle class parents' strategies of resistance, black middle class parents. And I have two research questions. How prevalent is resistance to the reproduction of racial inferiority in my sample of middle class black parents? And what strategies are parents using? So here's an example of racial socialization. Norris tells me, we'd watch movies and books. I was always buying books that talked about different black inventors or black history. Just, you know, always teaching her to be proud of who she was, telling her, my father telling her about his experiences, lessons about being black. And that uh, is true in a lot of different areas. I mean, sometimes parents were talking about black history, sometimes they were using it to uh, encourage kids to work hard in school. Sometimes they were strategizing about avoiding stereotypes or recognizing racism in action. So what I found was that resistance to reproducing racial inferiority was nearly ubiquitous in this black middle class sample. And I do want to say that sometimes, just because notions of racial inferiority so long, I'll say in racial inferiority, it, please understand notions whenever I, I omit it. Omit it. Um, and I found that uh, parents used a wide variety of strategies, among them frequent conversations around black history and culture, using institutions and role models. I'll unpack some of that in a few minutes. Uh, but that the clarity about what they were doing really varied. Not everybody was as clear about what they were doing or why they were doing it or what their goals were. And also then that the intensity of that resistance varied. People who were less clear obviously were less intense in what they were doing. So here's a theoretical frame. And social class inequities are one of the enduring features of modern society. They persist despite avowed egalitarianism and stated governmental goals of reducing inequality and ending poverty. One explanation for the perpetuation of social inequality is a reproduction of class, often through the very institutions that ostensibly seek to eradicate them. Numerous studies show that schools, while claiming to operate on a meritocratic system and aiming to provide a level playing field for all students, produce outcomes that are best predicted by the socioeconomic status of their families of origin. Despite the rationale on which they're organized, it appears that schools reproduce social class arrangements, producing workers who are suited to the varying demands of a capitalist economy based on their class origins. Both institutional forces and microprocesses contribute to these outcomes. 
The hidden curriculum, the organizing principles, and the linguistic conventions of educational institutions play an important role in the reproduction of social class. However, community norms, family culture, and personal decisions also contribute to the reproduction of class. The styles that parents adopt are an important part of the process of social reproduction. Among the middle class, the promotion of linguistic and reasoning skills and careful training in how to interact with institutions in a manner that elicits desired accommodations give children an advantage in educational settings and prepare them for the labor market. Give middle class children an advantage. This concerted cultivation practiced by middle class parents contrasts with the achievement of nat natural growth that working class and poor parents accept as the norm, focusing on children's entertaining themselves and interacting with family members rather than institutional representatives. The difference between these two parenting approaches have concrete consequences for children's achievement in elementary and school and beyond, even in high school. The construction of the concept of race can be likened to the reproduction of social class. Like class, race is a symbolic category that is shaped by social reality, a protean idea that is transformed by structural changes and reflects variations in social arrangements across different societies. The contradictions that are inherent in racial classification, such as the hypodescent rule that long prevailed here in the US, and the evolution of the racial status of different ethnic groups, such as the Irish and Jews, are not apparent to the average individual. Since race is not a natural biological category, individuals must be taught how to understand racial categorization. As in the case of social class, powerful institutional forces reproduce the social consequences of the concept of race, reifying it. Thus, though impersonal inequalities, thus through impersonal inequalities in the educational system, the job market, the criminal justice system, and other institutions, the concept of race powerfully shapes the experiences of those whom it stigmatizes, limiting their life chances, stunting their aspirations, and generating genuine biological conditions that shorten their lives. The comparison between the reproduction of social class and the construction of racial inequality extends beyond the institutional to the personal. Ubiquitous media messages, some of them subtle, some of them explosive, all of them powerful, shape conceptions of both race and class. Cultural practices at the level of the community and experiences in the family also influence how these concepts develop. The continuation of racial inequalities, stigmas, and stereotypes from one generation to the next through the operation of institutional mechanisms and cultural practices is the reproduction of race. The process of imposing the complex of ideas that reproduce racial and class categories is often evident to the groups on which it is inflicted. Working class youth in a famous study by Paul Willis rejected the imposition of middle class culture through their school when they perceived little possibility of being rewarded if they did well academically. Other studies of working class students and racial minorities have documented similar resistance. My research investigates how African Americans resist the imposition of notions of racial inferiority and how that form of resistance differs from other types of everyday resistance. There has been extensive debate about the meaning of the term resistance. There is widespread agreement regarding its use in the literature on social movements to refer to violent uprisings ranging from slave rebellions to peasant revolts. However, the term has been expanded to include less visible forms of subversive activity that oppose the imposition of an unjust system. Most acts of everyday resistance differ from classic resistance in several ways. Though in isolated cases they may involve violence, they are usually nonviolent, decentralized, furtive individual acts. However, these acts of everyday resistance are to some degree collective in nature, since they are typically widely practiced and supported by a shared culture 
that challenges the ideas that support the domination of the subordinate group. Acts of everyday resistance, such as sabotage, are more difficult for the dominant group to quell. While not necessarily openly targeting, targeted at overturning systems of domination as rebellions do, by virtue of their sustainability and their relatively low cost, such acts of everyday resistance are more likely to reduce the suffering of the dominated than violent upheavals, which are rarely successful. What may be achieved through everyday resistance must not be overstated, however. Some acts of everyday resistance may, in fact, be more effective than high-risk violent confrontation and may have dramatic outcomes. James Scott argues that desertion by Confederate soldiers during the Civil War contributed in a meaningful way to the victory of the Union. He presents it as an act of resistance on the part of these soldiers. However, it is probable that the vast majority of acts of everyday resistance do little to alter the power structure in which individuals are embedded. In most cases, actors are unable to meaningfully change systems of domination and must do their best to carve out a living within those structures. In this way, everyday resistance may be seen as incorporating elements of accommodation to the system in which the actor is embedded. However, actors do exercise agency through these small acts of rebellion, and often they're able to, to reduce the material burden they face through these acts, such as work stoppages or temporary flight from slavery. Just as important, by everyday acts of resistance, individuals are able to foster a logic that counters the ideology of the systems that dominate them. Underlying the structures that constitute an unjust system is a complex of ideas, a worldview, which justifies their existence and which renders the prevailing social arrangements both normal and invisible. This notion of ideology is critical to the discussion of resistance. To subvert the prevailing ideology in such a system, to develop and embrace a counter logic, does not by itself end domination, which is imposed by violence or other co coercive means and by enduring intergenerational patterns of disadvantage. However, to be completely convinced by the ideology that attributes poverty and deprivation merely to personal failure in the face of overwhelming structural obstacles is to ensure that those structures will never be challenged by organized resistance. Everyday resistance that opposes the prevailing ideology is critical because it functions as a seedbed or nurturing ground for mass resistance. From such beginnings may spring social movements engaged in campaigns that meet the most stringent definition of mass resistance, collective action that is organized clearly aimed at systems of domination and that employs effective and appropriate strategies. The effectiveness of everyday resistance in carving out ideological space for more active opposition to oppression gives it an important role in the study of resistance. However, the, de the debate over the nature of resistance is far from resolved. One attempt to deal with differing scholarly treatments of resistance was mounted by Hollander and Einmoner in their 2004 review. Based on an extensive review of the use of the term in the literature, they found that scholars were largely agreed on two elements of resistance. Resistance is uniformly conceived as requiring action rather than being a state of mind. It also implies opposition to living conditions, social structures, or other constraining systems. Hollander and Einwohner find that disagreement emerges as to whether oppositional action has to be intentional and whether it has to be visible in order to be considered resistance. Based on these two characteristics, they develop an eight-class typology, the most important feature of which is renaming classic and everyday resistance. The first, that is classic resistance, is classified as overt resistance, actions that are intended by the act, uh, actor to oppose domination and which are visible to the subordinate group. The second is referred to as covert resistance. These are intentional actions and though visible to observers, such as researchers, are not visible to the dominant group. Hollander and Einwohner unfortunately omit the central importance of ideology in resistance, although this issue has important implications for understanding the role of intentionality. Reacting against, uh, against oppression is arguably a human instinct, 
The initial impulse needs little thought or planning. However, this may simply be a rejection of hardship rather than a recognition of the injustice being perpetuated. Defining action as resistance is predicated on its relevance to undermining the ideology that both just justifies the action of the subordinate group and legitimates the oppression of the subordinate group. Therefore, unthinking instinctive action does not qualify as resistance. To have the potential to undermine oppressive ideology, there must exist, even if in a confused form, an awareness that the logic behind the existing social arrangements is unjust, as well as a rejection of material hardship. It is only action that intentionally opposes the ideational system undergirding oppression which can qualify as resistance. Resistance, then, is any action, including speech, which opposes the ideational structure underpinning a social system that imposes material losses or status insults on a subordinate group in favor of a subordinate class. Scott emphasizes the importance of ideology and includes status burdens among the domination to be resisted. Similarly, Ferguson defines resistance as anything that stands against or slips the yoke of material or ideological oppression. Whether unjust systems operate in historical contexts such as slavery, where oppression is obvious, or in the modern educational system, where injustice is less evident to us, it is associated with an ideology, a complex of ideas that justify prevailing social arrangements. This implies that in resistance, actors must to some degree recognize the operation of an unjust system and intend to stand against it, though the true nature of their speech or action may not be recognized by the superordinate group. The immediate achievements of resistance may be small relative to the system that it opposes. It may result only in lessening the material burden that the, sub the subordinate endure. It may even increase their oppression if the subordinate group retaliates against acts of resistance. Furthermore, everyday resistance is often accompanied by a measure of accommodation to injustice as the subordinate group seeks to survive under adverse conditions. Since the ideology which supports domination is critical to the justification of the actions of the superordinate group in establishing and maintaining an unjust system, any speech or action which intentionally opposes or undermines the underlying complex of ideas is legitimate resistance. The form of resistance discussed in my research, racial socialization, differs in important ways from previous work. Like other forms of resistance, it challenges the ideology that supports an oppressive system, a racial hierarchy. It includes both actions and speech acts that contest the notion that blacks are inferior to whites and thus opposes ideological oppression. It meets both of Hollander and Ayanwona's criteria for resistance since, since it involves both a sense of action and a sense of opposition. Regarding the issue of intentionality, this form of resistance is consistent with Scott's definition. Any act of a subordinate class that is or are intended to mitigate or deny claims, for example, prestige, made on that class by superordinate classes. The respondents in this study who are opposing the imposition of an ideology of racial inferiority are clearly and expressly doing so intentionally. However, their opposition differs from many similar acts in terms of visibility. Their acts are neither overt, visible to the dominant group, nor covert, deliberately hidden. Most forms of everyday resistance would be classified as covert using Hollander and Einwohner's system. However, racial socialization, unlike the other forms of resistance discussed here, is typically practiced removed from immediate contact with the superordinate racial group altogether. Much of it occurs between blacks of different generations and is thus truly invisible to whites, neither overt nor covert. In addition, the cultural practices comprising racial so socialization challenge racial domination first and foremost at the ideational level, whereas most other forms of resistance are targeted primarily at material resistance. They reject notions of racial inferiority by identifying historical examples of triumph over racial barriers to cultivate belief in black achievement, dignity, and competence. In this way, these practices do not pose any immediate threat to white privilege, though they undermine its very foundation by developing a counter logic to the prevailing understanding of racialized reality. Central to this counter logic is a recognition 
that a fundamentally unjust complex of ideas, structures, and practices that overwhelmingly privileges whites holds sway. Closely related is a process of identifying specific instances of structural interpersonal racism in daily life, connected to tactics to preempt and undermine its operation. Ultimately, this alternative view of the world aims at the creation of a self-confident, achievement-oriented racial identity grounded in the knowledge of the intellectual achievements of blacks and of historical victories over racial oppression. By virtue of its being largely invisible to whites, there are in the current era no substantial consequences for this form of resistance, in contrast to other forms of everyday resistance. For example, during slavery, pilfering or malingering would elicit severe punishment if detected. Even in the current context, women asserting their equality in the face of machismo male culture may face negative social consequences. Racial so socialization, on the other hand, is unlikely to elicit any negative outcomes in and of itself. In some regards, these practices also pose a challenge to the material disadvantages faced by blacks because they include strategies to overcome racialized inequality in access to educational resources. Furthermore, one purpose of racial socialization is to equip black adolescents to, complete, to compete successfully, first in the academic arena and ultimately in the job market. In this way, it may also oppose barriers to material success. So I'd like to talk a little bit about the methodology. This was a quantitative study conducted in the greater Boston metropolitan area. I conducted interviews with over 80 middle class families defined by the occupation of the spouse. So middle class status was defined by the occupation of the spouse with the highest socioeconomic status. Data from 39 black, 38 black families with 57 black adolescents were used in the analysis. The median income of all I'm actually going to come back to this. Um, the median income of all black families in the study was $125,000 per annum. The sample was solidly middle class, although the lower middle class was underrepresented with only 16% of black families coming from the clerical occupational category. Profession, professional and semi-professional families were equally represented each comprising 42% of the black families involved. All black mothers had at least some college education with roughly half of the sample holding a bachelor's degree, while 58% held advanced degrees. Most adolescents attended predominantly white schools, which were often public schools in white suburbs or independent schools. Some parents reported on strategies used during the adolescence of their young, of their young adult children who were college aged at the time of the study. The practice of resistance to the production of reproduction of racial inferiority was nearly ubiquitous. The respondents in this study, with one exception, all saw the need to resist racist ideation. However, there were varying levels of clarity and determination among respondents. The vast majority of these black middle class parents perceived racism from a, through a frame that I will call not over yet and very actively resisted the reproduction of notions of racial inferiority. A few parents who used a confused about race frame were deeply ambivalent, seemingly unsure of how to react to racism, and apparently not clear about its power to harm their adolescents. A very small group, about two, uh, actually denied that racism was still an issue. So, the vast majority who, pay, who adopted this not over yet frame, these black parents paid attention to the long history of racism in the US and to lessons from years of their own personal experience of racialized interactions. They expected that their adolescents would encounter structural barriers in the form of low expectations for academic performance or higher standards for blacks. They recognized that negative stereotypes of blacks are still prevalent. However, these black parents exhibited a cautious expectancy that racism is declining. They expected more of white adolescents than of white parents, and they didn't reject their adolescents' charges that they, the black parents, were exhibiting reverse racism at times. They seemed to accept the notion that racism is receding rather than morphing into a less recognizable but equally powerful form. So what were their strategies? 
The first set of strategies were targeted at created, creating a confident, achievement-oriented racial identity in their adolescence that was grounded in the knowledge of the cultural and intellectual achievements of blacks and of historical victories over racial oppression. The first two strategies listed were extremely common, even among some of the parents whose brain was confused about racism. So parents would teach about black history. They would read their kids' books when they were small, very small. They'd be reading children's books about Benjamin Banneker, Banneker and other black scientists, for exam example. They would take their children to visits to Boston's Museum of African American History or on the Black Freedom Trail. They would watch movies with them like Roots and Glory, very common practice. They also really worked at promoting self-esteem. Again, they used uh, dolls. If you had a black daughter, almost I think every mother in the study made sure that her daughter had black dolls and not white dolls, not just white dolls. Uh, and they would use books that promoted a positive sense of racial identity. Um, but some parents went beyond this. Those were sort of the standard fare. Some of them were really using schools. Now, remember that a lot of these kids are in predominantly white elite schools. They're either in public schools in elite um, suburbs or they're, they're in independent elite schools. And these parents would use the schools to actually advance racial identity. Uh, one mother got, became the chair of the diversity committee and basically corralled the school into having school-wide Black History Month, um, I don't want to say celebrations because they were really educational efforts that she got them to do year after year until she could step down off of the committee. Um, another mother would you know, get her get the school to have her husband come in and play jazz because he was a jazz musician. So they were using the very instrument of reproducing ra notions of racial inferiority to actually promote a positive racial identity. Another mother, uh, and this was common, to engage her, her daughter who was becoming disinterested in school, you know, promoted the use of um, black figures like Harriet Tubman, let's write this paper on Harriet Tubman. You know, she talked about her own experiences uh, in the movement. So mothers were using a lot of different strategies that went beyond the typical, let me read you a black book and buy you a black doll. The other thing that they did was that they used pairs and role models to promote self-esteem. The most obvious one is Jack and Jill. A lot of parents, because, in particular because their kids were isolated, living in largely white suburbs, would use membership in uh, an organization like Jack and Jill so that their children would have black peers who would build this positive racial identity. Oh, so I need to explain what Jack and Jill is? Okay, so Jack and Jill is... Um, <laughs> Oh, I, I actually thought that this was for bougie blacks. <laughs> uh, so it really is a group created by middle class black parents. They have their kids join. They have regular meetings. Uh, kids stay in it for years. It starts, I think, as early as middle school. Um, one mother, I interviewed her while her kids were in a session on um, how to be, how to manage your money. So a lot of it is educational, but they also have parties and socials and sleepovers. Uh, it's a thing. Um, black bourgeois. Black bourgeois. <laughs> yes, not black nationalists. Black bourgeois. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, but, but, mo but mothers used a variety of strategies. One mother, though she lived way out in the suburbs, most of this, was, this research was done here in the greater Boston metropolitan, extensive, you know, way beyond the metropolitan area, but she lived out in the suburbs. They would commute into Boston to go to a black church, and her motivation was not just because this was her, her spiritual style, her cultural style, that was involved as well, but her really driving motivation was to get role models for her black son. That's what really got her up Sunday mornings to drive all the way into Boston so that she could provide role models. So parents were very clear about that. Some parents, some parents. 
but the other thing that they did was they really looked at strategies that would block the effects of racism. Um, they had tactics to preempt and undermine the operation of structural and interpersonal racism in daily life. One of them was really resisting low academic expectations. So one mother, her daughter wanted to get into AP biology in one of these uh, public schools in an elite uh, white system, public school system, and the teachers were not supportive at all. You know, this actually happened like two of her daughters. So the first one missed the deadline and the next one they were like, you haven't checked this box, you haven't checked that box. She was not having it. She was not taking no for an answer. She got her kids into that AP course and they excelled. Uh, another mother felt that her daughter was getting a C and the history teacher was like, that's okay. This was an independent private school, an independent school and that mother went in there and raised, and she got black on them, and her daughter was moved out of that teacher's classroom, put into a classroom where the expectations were higher because a C was not good enough, and for a teacher to tell you that a C was good enough wasn't acceptable, especially since she was sure he wasn't telling white kids that a C was good enough. Other parents used the pairs to promote the, uh, to resist these low academic expectations, so two mothers had independently, not related to each other, I don't think they even knew each other, had set up pair groups for their kids so that uh, Professor Terry is nodding because he actually worked in a similar program that my husband and I organized to serve our son with the help of Professor Gay. It's 15 years, I believe. We're still doing it. Not, time for you to come back and speak for us, Professor Gay. Yes. Du Bois Society. Society. But these parents, Sorry about the personal side. These parents had organized their peer groups for their kids so that they had activities that were focused on achievement and also social interaction. Because a really key part of academic achievement is having a peer group that supports those aspirations. It's not just that you need to get together to work. You need to have friends who are going to share this. You need to socialize. It's an important part. And so two mothers had actually set up groups like that for their kids. They also worked at bl blocking racist exclusion. So they would actually say to their kids, did you see what that woman just did? That was racism. You know, we were in line and she took someone else first. So they were educating their kids. They were seizing opportunities to educate their kids about how they might be excluded by somebody else's behavior. And the most uh, aggressive of these parents, I don't want to say aggressive, the ones who are most focused and clearest about what they were doing would actually start these conversations with children. They would start early in childhood. So there's a kind of conflicting tendency here. One is people who were hesitant wouldn't point out racist incidents to their children till they were tweens or maybe teenagers, right? They wanted to shelter them. So things would happen that were clearly racist, but they wouldn't talk to their kids about them. But these parents who were very clear about what they were doing and about why they were doing it would start the conversations early, even when kids were young. There's a conflicting tendency, though, that what would also happen is parents who weren't clear about what they were doing, after they had bought the black dolls and read the black storybooks, didn't know what to do next. So when their child got to adolescence, they didn't really have any strategies in place about what they were supposed to be doing. But these parents who were really clear about what their goals were, they had the strategies. I've described some of them. So there's an interesting kind of crossover happening uh, between these two groups and their strategies as kids go from, being, from childhood into adolescence. Uh, I do have one more uh, quotation for you. So this is Edwina, and boy, Edwina went hard. Edwina uh, is a lawyer here in the Boston area. She said, I made it my business to always go to school stuff, to offer my services to schools, to just kind of be vigilant. Like Black History Month is coming up. Talk to the teachers. What are you doing? What's going on? What sort of programs do you have planned? She was pushing. She was turning this school into a place where kids would learn about black history, where the school would promote, this white school would promote 
uh, a positive racial identity. My husband went in a couple of times and performed for them for free just to help. Let's show them what jazz is, do a little historical thing about jazz, teach them some music, that sort of thing. So that's just one example. I, I don't have many of, of those. That was just a holdover from another presentation. They also had a different discursive style, a different way they talked about racism. They were expansive. They would go into detail. They would raise it before I asked. Uh, there was, however, also some obfuscation, you know, like they'd start to say something and then they'd back up. And, and so there, 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 there was still some kind of ambivalence. Like in, the, in today's world, you're not supposed to say things are racist, right? You're not supposed to necessarily name them. And so there would be some hesitancy among some of these parents, not Edwina. Mm -mm. But some of these parents who were, so even within that group, which I call it ain't over yet, there's still some variation within that group. Uh, can I have a, a time check, please? I need to. Oh, all right, I have time. All right, thank you. So these parents who were confused about racism, remember this is a small minority. You know, I, I'm not sure, but it's probably about eight out of the 38 parents. Um, and they exhibited a lot of ambivalence about racism. They seemed unsure of how to react to racism, and they didn't seem to be sure about how deeply it could influence their kids. They, they would go back and forth. So I'll give you an example. Um, one mother is in the Apple store with her sons, and you know when you're pl they, they have the iPads, everybody can play with the iPads, but if uh, the iPad is lifted off of its base, an alarm goes off. They're in the store, the alarm goes off, and she was like, I know what you're going to do. They rushed right over to her children to say that they were the ones who were trying to walk off with the iPad when in fact her kids weren't involved at all. Now you think that's a teachable moment. Edwina would certainly have talked to her son about it, not this mother. She hesitated. And even, and these, her, her son was not five years old, you know, that, era, that age where you're typically protecting a lot of parents, not you, but some of the parents were still protecting their kids. This was a child who was 11 years old, and she didn't explain to him. In fact, they had, um, they had someone staying with them who had a racist interaction or, or was treated in a racist manner in front of her son. And the son kept saying, Mom, what was that about? Mom, was that about? And she never told him. She didn't explain to him what was going on. Okay, so she recognizes the racism, but she's really ambivalent about how to deal with it in terms of uh, talking to her children about it. So some of their strategies were, they tended to depend on schools to teach their children about race. So um, uh, one mother had put her son you know, in a school that she loved uh, when he was young. Um, so it was, it was like one of the freedom schools, you know, it was a preschool, a black-oriented, Afrocentric preschool, and she was like, I'm asking her about a child who's 11 years old, and when she talks about what she did, she's talking about what she did when he was three or four or five, right? So she's depending on the school to teach him, and she doesn't have any strategies of her own. Um, I talked about their being hesitant to, oh, let me give you one other example of being hesitant to teach about race. This is a couple who lives in one of the suburbs, not a white suburb, but a black a, a suburb that was going from predominantly white to substantially black. And the police were harassing young black men as this school, uh, town went through this transition. And this couple had a 16-year-old son, but they did not school him. They didn't say, here's how you deal with the police. They didn't have that talk with him about how police are likely to see young black men and what strategies he should be using to protect himself if he's pulled over by the police. So they're very ambivalent, very hesitant to speak on it. Uh, another mother ignored the need for black peers and role models. So she sent her son to this elite white elementary school, a very good elementary school, but it was very white. It doesn't occur to her, and she was familiar with this school because her father had done some kind of summer program there when she was growing up. She really knew the school. It didn't occur to her till her son was sitting there on the first day that he was the only black child in, I guess, his class, his grade. It didn't occur to her. She wasn't thinking ahead like Edwina, who was bringing her son in to town to have black peers. This mother wasn't even thinking in those terms. 
And she, in fact, a lot of their life revolved around a very white church. Um, they limited racial socialization, as I said earlier, to childhood. They didn't have strategies that extended beyond buying the books and buying the dolls. And they tended to limit racial socialization to exposure to black culture. They weren't analyzing racialized experiences, whether what was seen on TV or what was ex encountered in day-to-day -day life. Their style was that they were very hesitant to talk about race, or they were silent, you know, didn't have much to say. The last, uh, so I'll skip that one, but uh, the parents who are in the denying racism frame, you see there's not a lot to say about them. They did, in at least one case, come right out and say, I don't see race. Uh, they didn't have any strategies because they didn't see this as a problem. And they then had very little to say when asked about uh, racial socialization. But as I said, this was a tiny minority. So the vast majority of parents in this study were using speech and other forms of action to oppose the imposition of an ideology of racial inferiority. Their actions were intentional in almost all instances and strategic in many cases. However, they were invisible to the dominant racial group. Clearly, this is an interesting case of everyday resistance. It is also apparent that not all parents were equally engaged in resisting racial ideation. The frame that parents adopted regarding racism guided their action and the level of resistance they practiced. Parents using the it's not over yet frame ardently resisted the prevailing racialized worldview. They taught their children from an early age that black people, and by extension the child herself, were strong people who had accomplished much. They challenged the notion that whiteness was normative and from an early age protected their children from cultural artifacts such as white dolls that would impose that view on them. They used institutions and role models to teach about black achievement. They did not disengage from the process of defending their offspring from notions of racial inferiority as they became adolescents. The resistance practiced through racial socialization is clearly first and foremost in the realm of ideas and in terms of how social reality is conceived. The goal is to contest the prevailing understanding of black identity, to debunk the existence of a racial hierarchy which places blacks at the bottom in intelligence, achievement, and humanity. Since the justification of injustice is a foundation of systemic inequality, providing an alternative lens on black identity for, for youth is a bold act of resistance. And finally, this study points to the very intentional resistance to the reproduction of notions of racial inferiority practiced by some middle-class black parents. It also reveals the varying levels of awareness in the group of individuals. The frames that these parents adopt not only influence how they interpret interactions and institutional arrangements, and how they reinterpret events outside of the prevailing racial ideology. The different frames that parents employ also affect the extent to which they work to pass on their frame to adolescents and provide them with an alternative perspective on racialized reality. That was very interesting, Jackie. Uh, so, uh, this is, uh, as you point out, a work, in pro uh, work in process, so I... Very early stage. Yeah, and so I, my first question deals with that. Yes. And then I have a, a, a follow-up question. So uh, I would suggest uh, that when you write this up for publication, that you really don't need your detailed uh, discussion of uh, acts of everyday resistance at the beginning. Okay. I mean, that's kind of, a, to me, that was a distraction. Okay. Um, and what you want to do is you want to call out from the literature those points, I guess mostly sort of I'm thinking of that typology and so on, that would really help to inform uh, the findings in your study. Because you see, what makes your study interesting is the rich description that you have. And once you got into that, okay. it really, I mean, you really had my attention. 
Okay. So I, 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 think, I don't think you need you know, all that theoretical, not so much the theoretical, but discussion of the literature at the beginning. Cut Just short. be very succinct, pull out the ones that directly inform uh, your research. Because as I said to you many times, your findings are very rich, very interesting, and that's what you really want to highlight. Okay. Okay. Thank the you. second. Thank you. Uh, uh, now my question is, uh, you know, based on the responses of um, your respondents, um, it's quite clear how they manifest or express overt resistance to uh, racist uh, ideology. But I didn't get a sense of how the covert resistance was manifested. I wonder if you would talk yeah, about that. So I, I, I'm not arguing that this is covert. I'm arguing that it doesn't fall neatly into that overt, covert um, dichotomy. Because you know, covert resistance is deliberately hidden. People are trying to mask what they're doing. These parents are not doing that. Uh, but it's not overt in the sense that it's invisible. And so I think a third term is really appropriate. Uh, this is, for the most part, invisible, that white people are, are uh, not just individuals, but the, the, the whole, uh, the institutions that would impose these ideas of racial inferiority on their kids don't even know the parents are doing this, except in a few cases. And that's when they're actually using the institutions to promote ideas of, uh, of a positive black identity. So I don't think it falls neatly. I wouldn't say it's overt. I wouldn't say that it's covert. I think it's mostly invisible, except in a few instances. Yes. Oh, okay. Oh, I'm sorry. I, oh, I'm so sorry. No problem. Um, thank you, Jackie. I really, really enjoyed this. And I have a question that kind of followed up on a point you made um, in the group about the kind of racial and the ambivalent group yes. about race when you mentioned some of the socialization around or lack of socialization around strategies of dealing with police or actively dealing with anti-black racism and white supremacy. Yes. And was curious about some of these other gender dynamics of racial socialization that you were seeing, even when you mentioned the dolls earlier and affirming this, but what kind of dynamics you saw that maybe were gender specific or gender neutral in terms of that, and if those practices something, I wonder if this is classed in a certain way, were these parents engaging things like hashtag black girl joy, I mean black girl magic, hashtag black boy joy, to kind of think through black resiliency in different processes of racial socialization? So none of them mentioned using social media, so that's a good question. Um, uh, it's hard to speak to the question of the gender dynamics since overwhelmingly the interviews were with mothers. Uh, though in, I would say, 75% of the cases, uh, the father was also present in the home. Um, I, uh, there, there are not clear, strong gender dynamics that I can see in the racial socialization. You know, some parents did have that talk, not just fathers, sometimes mothers or mothers reported on talks, what their husbands did about uh, the danger that boys faced. So that, would, that was a theme and that was, didn't happen as much with girls. The other theme which wasn't strong enough for me to really say much about is, and I think is typical now of the way things are going uh, in terms of males and female adolescents, regardless of race, is that boys tended to be having a harder time in school than girls. I mean, there were a couple of superstar girls. You know, the parents are like, I don't know what happened. She just ended up at Princeton, and now she's done, I forget, some fancy law school, and now she's, you know, working at one of the top firms in New York. And girls tended to sort of have that strong drive to perform academically, and boys, the parents were often pulling teeth. But I can't say that I really observed other clear uh, gender dynamics, but it's a good question. Oh, yes. Hi, Jackie, thank you for this, um, which clearly struck a nerve with me. Um, <laughs> I had two questions, one of which is, with your sample group being in Boston, I wonder about, I'm from Newark, just moved from, and moved just, it's been five and a half years. 
um, moved from the greater Philadelphia area. And there's something very distinctive about um, the black middle class in Boston, which I wonder whether you will address in the book. Um, some very, some idiosyncrasies about this particular area. Um, and then also my second question is, do you account for different, the different kind of backgrounds of the parents and whether some of these um, parents are um, American born, either first generation or um, beyond, um, and then also immigrant families, black okay. immigrant families, and what the dynamics might be um, in terms of education and these kinds of levels of resistance. So I, um, that first question is a very good question. I had not thought about addressing those idiosyncrasies, but I shall now that you have suggested it. Um, I thought about what? Addressing Boston. the idiosyncrasies of, it's of very, the Boston It's a Latin very class. different, and, and sort of that you almost need, I'm not in jo Jack and Jill, but you sort of need these organizations much more because it's much, much harder to connect to black families in the Boston area if you're not from here or if you're not directly in the city, et cetera. So. Not here, from here, a hundred years ago. A hundred right. years ago. Right, right. Old black aristocracy, this was, yes. this was ultimate free Negro uh, paradigm, I mean, for 200 years. Right. I don't know. It's a uh, I gotta, that, I that's, how are you going to deal with that? I will have to start yeah. thinking about that. I've not thought about that before. Or whether, but I don't, I mean, it's probably it's too much to ask for another thing, sample no, from no, elsewhere. No, no, no. I mean, says, one thing is perfect. That's true of us in general. For outsiders to penetrate. And so the resistance comes up in a very different way than if you're in a Philadelphia or DC or Atlanta. Right. So um, your, res your, your strategies have to be played much differently here than in other parts so of the country. So I do think it's certainly true that I need to highlight uh, and should have highlighted in this that I recognize the limitations of this. That this really is talking about people, a black middle class sample you know, it's qualitative research. I can't generalize from it. I can't say this is how black parents do it across the country. Um, I can say this seems to give us some information about how black parents in Boston do it. So those caveats will definitely be in place. Um, I do think it's interesting, though, to explore the question of uh, what the idiosyncrasies of Boston middle class, and in particular black middle class, are. But it's class is more complicated than money, particularly in a place like Boston. Money. It is. You know, if your great grandfather, great great grandfather was free, as opposed to being a slave, that puts you in a different class. No matter if you're making two dollars and fifty cents, and particularly in Boston, right? True. So the best way we could handle that was really, you know, I, I thought about this a lot, and the best way I could find to handle it was to use the Weberian system of uh, class uh, hierarchy. So, looking at not income. Because you could be a policeman and earning $100,000, sure. but rather looking at occupations. And uh, are you white collar? There were very few white collar. Mo mainly these people were managerial or professional. Uh, so they were executives or professionals for the most part. But I also got information on income and <laughs> on education. And as you see that they are highly educated. Um, Income, uh, I, I also had a white sample, and the income in the black sample was substantially lower than in the white sample. The other thing that I, I gathered information on their background, you know, what, what, were, what was the status of their parents, mm -hmm. both mother's parents and father's parents, and I found that in fact they were, most of the black middle class were emerging middle class. Their parents had been working class, not surprising. My white sample, the opposite was true. They were mostly second generation, at least middle class. But did you <laughs> have a box for immigrant? Oh, the question about immigrants. I deliberately did my best to not include immigrants because it just opens up so many questions about uh, to what extent is this a result of their being immigrant, you know? Um, and from a majority black population like Jamaica exactly. or Haiti. Exactly, so exactly. They bring a different culture altogether. Right. So it, it, in such a small sample, it would have been too hard to try and sort that all out. So I uh, got around it by, for the most part. I had maybe one or two who were second generation immigrants, but I tried to not have immigrants. 
I screened them. Mm -hmm. I did. What, what's interesting to me, though, is that the, the presumption, which no one has challenged, is that there is, this is like, this is the black world, and outside these walls, there's a hurricane, a Blood. tornado of anti-black racism. And that if we step out, we have to be armed against it. Did you find people who didn't believe that? So I don't think that these parents thought there was a tornado. I think these parents thought that there were, I don't, more than, more than a strong gust, right? That, that, <laughs> that you were going to, it was going to come and go. It was going to ebb and flow. You were going to, but that overall, you had to be ready, right? You had to be able to think differently. So it wasn't so much, even though these things ebbed and flowed, even though you weren't always going to run into some kind of racist incident as you stepped out of the house, those racist incidents build a long-term view of the world, and what they were doing was changing kids' worldview. That's, that's my impression. One or two denied that that was, needed to do, was necessary at all. The other trend that I found that I um, didn't mention here is that parents did see this as something that was evolving. So they had, they expected that their kids' friends were less racist than those friends' white parents. And they recognized, like when their, when their kids said to them, oh, you're just being racist, mom, they didn't repudiate it and say, that, just you wait and see. In some cases, it turned into just you wait and see, and the kids had to back up and say, you were right. But um, they recognized that things were shifting. Lorena. Thank you very much, Jackie. Um, I have two questions uh, with regard to the theoretical framing yes. uh, and the question of resistance. Yes. And they're related. So one is informed probably by the fact that I'm a working class kid and I went to a public school in Europe, um, so the setting is a different one. But while I was listening to you um, and your descriptions of what mothers would do and like, you know, go to the school and make sure that the kid is doing A and B. I actually felt like, well, that's one of the main differences I see between middle and working class uh, in terms of that my parents didn't check me that way and it has good parts. Um, so the sense of liberty you have as a working class kid. So I was wondering, um, what is it, is an one act, one thing all the time in the sense that what the mother would want to do is to kind of resist racial discrimination, but she's at the same time playing out a powerful role in the hierarchical relation she has with the child. So in a way, is it's a kind of exerting power on the child at the same time. So an act of resistance becomes an act of control um, over the child. So I was wondering if you can kind of see that dynamic in things, that acts can be different things um, depending on how you look at them and who looks at them and the child might have a different sense of it. And the second question is at the more structural level. So I work on colonialism and my sense was that the literature you were discussing, I don't know that literature, um, makes resistance uh, dependent on a certain notion of the political. Um, in particular ways, and it's actually everything that is not considered to be in the realm of the political is not going to qualify as resistance. And that's actually in the colonial context a fundamental strategy in ruling people that you're simply going to do everything the native does is not a political act. You know, that's going to be a violent act, it's going to be a criminal act, it's going to be a personal act whatever, it's never gonna be part of the political domain. And that's what disqualifies it as a political act of resistance. And so if you look, for example, I mean in educational domains that might be less obvious, but if you look at crime, so-called, so a violent act, someone killing a person in a colonial context and you have a racial kind of configuration, what is it? Is it simply murder? Or is it an act of resistance because this person has actually been um, treating the perpetrator out of a racist motivation? So those complications are yeah. at a structural level. All right, so I think that in terms of the kids experiencing this as control, I think that that's undoubtedly true, that 
a lot of what the parents were doing uh, was seen very differently by the kids. I didn't get a chance to interview the kids, but uh, the very fact that the kids would say to their parents, you're being racist, indicates that they saw things quite differently. So I'm confident you're right about that. But not all of what they're doing, I think, can be a part of this uh, a control strategy. You know, the buying the dolls, the reading the books, the taking them to museums. There are a lot of different strategies. Some of them I do think you could see having elements of control and that the child would read it that way. You know, the sociologist, University of Pennsylvania, I'm blocking on her name. Laro. Yeah. Yes. I mean, you discuss her literature yes. and you talk, you, you, you show so how, that's what I would, how the class yes. issue it has to come into play here and addresses her first question. Yes, absolutely. So okay, one I just of want the, to make sure you give yourself credit. That's thank you. <laughs> thank you very much, Bill. Thank you. Um, it's certainly true that these strategies of intervening at school are very middle class strategies. And as Bill pointed out, that's the heart of Annette Laro's groundbreaking book, uh, Unequal Childhoods. But I really did try to control for that because I focused on middle class parents for that very reason, because it has, the literature shows that working class and middle class parents have very different strategies. And so I, I didn't want to mix apples and oranges, and I was looking at what middle class black parents do. They, in fact, use very similar strategies to middle class white parents. Uh, in terms of the question of colonialism and what constitutes resistance, I think actually that these uh, scholars are arguing that those very actions which are deemed violence are in fact resistance. I think they're arguing for seeing what pilfering, for example, you know, to the um, slave owner or, or to the uh, landowner in Malaysia where James Scott did his research, that's just stealing. But to James Scott, to Eugene Genovese, this is actually an act of resistance. So I would, I, I think they see it quite differently. Yes. Hi, thank you so much for your talk. Um, a couple of questions, you know, I remember as a kid seeing a chain gang in Texas um, of prisoners, and I remember asking my mother, I was like seven years old, and saying, um, you know, why are all these men chained up? But, you know, I thought slavery was over. And I said, we learned that in school, that slavery was over. And she said, well, uh, yeah, honey. And I said, well, why are they all black? You know, and she couldn't answer that question because to explain institutional racism to a seven-year-old is very difficult. So I was wondering, um, you know, if you had many instances where kids actually came to the parents because something had happened and they struggled or had a solution on how to resolve it um, or how to talk about it or how to begin that conversation because when you talk about the, you know, the ones who denied racism versus the group that, you know, the it's not over group, yeah. um, I was wondering if there's any distinguishing characteristics between them and their, you know, their histories um, and if they called on something that happened, you know, when they were children to help them with this because I think you can definitely trace these steps of, you know, how people deal with having these conversations, but what's the historical context and how they resolved or grown or, you know, had solutions to these? And do you trace those solutions in a quantitative, you know, how do, how do you quantitatively look at that? Yeah. Um, so, so a couple of parents referred to incidents in their own childhood. If, and it was, uh, or if they didn't refer to an actual incident, it was clear that uh, lived experiences, the things that they had learned over their lifetime, was really shaping what they were doing with their kids. Um, and occasionally, they gave examples of kids having, you know, it, it tended to be the more typical, I saw my, I'll, I'll give you one example. Mother told me that her son saw his, the headmistress of his school in the supermarket somebody who knew him well, right, and he knew her, and he's racing up to her to greet her warmly. She sees a little black boy running towards her and grabs her purse, and how hurt he was, right? So it was more that kind of incident that parents had to help their kids deal with. 
Uh, the question of structural racism is one I'm still really trying, uh, and institutional racism, I'm still trying to think through, you know, looking at how parents dealt with that because that's not as clear, I think, in the data. So I think that that's an excellent question, one I'm still working on. One really quick question too, are there any visual materials? Um, did you photograph any of these I did not. Families? Okay, I just curious. Not. Yes, Harry. Oh, thank you, Jackie, so much for your presentation. Um, I have two questions, and I can ask them one at a time or together, but I just wanna say I think it's really interesting that parents would pull back from talking about race to young children when they talk about all other kinds of things that are important and that are necessary and are involved in survival. So I, 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 I just think that's really interesting and probably deserves some questioning. Uh, but my questions are... You, you mean I should question whether they actually did it? Well, no, um, I'm not saying you should. I, I'm just wondering why, because I hear this a lot about parents saying, well, this is okay, like so race is the one subject that they're not gonna engage young children on. Mm -hmm. And yet it's, it's the thing that they're gonna be, that's gonna be following them into the, right, so into the tomb. That? May I speak to that? I think that parents saw themselves as protecting their children, the parents who adopted that strategy. They felt life's hard, uh, let, me, let me hold you close, let me protect you from the harsh realities of life for a while. I think they recognized, most of these parents, that they were eventually going to talk about, I mean, I, I described the parent who did not discuss the incident at the Apple store, but she said, you know, I know I've got to talk to him about this. Uh, would, did she ever get to it? I don't know. But it's the sense that, Life is so harsh, I'm trying to preserve your innocence for as long as I can. Does that make sense is the question that I'm asking. And I'm not asking you to answer it here. I'm just saying, but it's a question to does be that make sense? It's a question to be asked. So my two questions, um, your definition of resistance. Yes. Must the resistant action work for it to be qualified as resistance? Okay, so there's a lot in the literature on that. And James Scott, a uh, leading scholar at Yale, who really did a groundbreaking uh, study of this in 1985, he argues very strongly, no, it doesn't have to. If you have a peasant uprising that's completely crushed, is it not resistance? If people died fighting for their freedom, are they not resisting? You cannot predict how resistance will, will actually work out. In fact, you could have more oppression as a result of that uprising. It's still resistance. So even if it has an opposite effect, you can't argue that people weren't resisting. And that's the position you hold? Yes, I think that that's absolutely true. I think that uh, it only makes sense. It is the act of opposition which is resistance. It's not the victory that is resistance. Okay, and um, second yeah. question. In terms of white middle class parents yeah. and black middle class parents, they're considered middle class because of occupation, income, education, background, things of that nature. Yes. To what degree do black middle class parents cease to be middle class or get demerits on it because of all the things that they have to confront and deal with that white parents do not? Like, like it's almost like a form of taxation, you might say. So that was one of the questions I considered in the uh, presentation that I was thinking about doing today. And that is, so does it mean that because you're so busy spending time on racial socialization, you don't have time to do all the things Lorena was talking about? Yeah, go, to, to, the go school, to the beach. Check the homework. Um, no evidence of that. These parents who are doing racial socialization, the ones who are pushing it harder, as far as I could see, were probably also pushing the academic socialization harder too. In some cases, uh, there was variation by the uh, groups within the middle class and the, you know, it, it's, it's hard to say, especially in a qualitative study, a small sample, but it looked as though people who had a higher class status were pushing harder on these things. Well, for black parents, a focus on racial socialization compensated for class. And if you couldn't, if you didn't have the money to move out to one of these suburbs where they had great schools, you'd find a way if you were one, a parent who was really pushing on racial socialization. You would find some strategy that got your kid into one of those schools in the middle class suburbs. But yeah. what I mean is, to the degree that a black parent has to take all these strategies, oh, okay. and that white parents are just served by the yeah, system. Does, it, does, their, does their status, is their status diminished? That is not a question I have data to speak to. It's a good Thank question. You.
There's a, but there, there's another question though. <clears throat> I, you know, I'm looking at Bill Wilson, Cornell West, just just the our generation, right? I can't imagine, though I've never asked Cornell, never asked Bill, I have a feeling in their nursery there wasn't a picture of Harriet Tubman and W.E.B. Du Bois, right? You know, there, there's not, what I'm trying to say is there's not a simple correlation between black history lessons and having positive self-esteem, right? Or thinking that Cleopatra's black, which she wasn't, or that there were black pharaohs, which there were, you know, et cetera, et cetera. That it's how a person turns out in terms of their self-esteem, their sense of themselves, their multiple identities, one of which is as a black person, is enormously complicated, much more complicated than just giving them doses of, you know, who discovered, you know, the Stevie Wonder song, a black man, you know, <laughs> like, who discovered traffic lights, a black man. Uh, so, and I've never quite, I, I don't think anybody knows. You know, if, if you were in a black community where you saw doctors, this is Wilson, Wilson 101, right? You had positive role models, it was safe, it was self-contained. That probably was better even than just having Black History Month, you know, once a year. You, you had Black History Month every day. You knew Dr. So-and-so was there and you could aspire, you could go to Howard, you could go to um, Spelman or something. I, I just, I just, I'm not saying this well, but I think you understand where I'm coming from. What makes for, what do, does anyone know even, or do we just, throw out a whole bunch of shit and then see whatever lands, hoping that these poor children won't be crushed by an anti-black racist um, metaphysic. Okay, so again, I don't have data because I didn't talk to the kids, but there has been research that shows that you are quite right, it's not a straight line. It's not that just because you teach your kids this, they automatically have um, a positive self-esteem. Uh, but interestingly, one of the parents use that strategy that you were talking about growing up. I mean, she didn't move to the South and some, but she made sure that all of the uh, professionals that her kids came in contact with, in particular their pediatrician, was black. Right. So she was using this idea of role models. And I, I think one of the difficulties with doing this kind of, uh, well, how does it work out, is the fact that there's so much variation among the parents. So not everybody's going as hard as Edwina. Not everybody's going as hard as Rakisha, the parent who made sure that her kid was exposed only to black professionals. Um, and arguably, those parents have more of, well, no, I'll give you the counterexample. Rakisha was so serious that one of her daughters got into an elite private high school. She's a middle class parent, but you know, it's a little bit of a stretch to pay for independent school here in the Massachusetts, in, in the Boston area. And she felt that her daughter was getting too white. She pulled her daughter out of the school. She pulled her daughter out of the school and uh, sent her to one of the public schools. Not, not a Boston public school, a good public school, but, but you, know what you know what effect it had? Ridiculous. Do she you got know, problems, yeah. Do you know what effect it had? I agree with Professor Wilson. Skip, do you know what effect it had? What effect? Absolutely none. Really? She still was Sididian jiving. Her daughter is still very white oriented. She's like, if any one of my daughters is going to marry white, it's this one. Yeah, but she could just be reacting to the black nationalism of her mother. She could be. You know, that's so, what children do, but right? Children but, I, do. but I think Skip's point, though, can I just get it? Well, thank yeah, you so much, Professor. I wasn't going to ask the question, but Skip. That, that on the one hand, if you have rich, gemeinschaft-like relations on the chocolate side of town, because some of us had a Palestinian Jew who looked like Michelangelo's uncle on the wall named Jesus, who still had well, pastors, deacons, deaconess, ushers, well, teachers. Lucky he looked like that and didn't look like some white man. Well, that's true, but I mean, Michelangelo's a good-looking Italian brother, but... <laughs> but it still wasn't a black Jesus. But I think Skip's point is, though, that the injection of black historical figures still is too abstract in terms of the lived experience of young folk live, growing up in a white supremacist society. So if they have a rich Gemeinschaft and like relation, not just black doctors, but just black folk who have self-respect and self-confidence, working class, whatever, you see. So this, in that sense, is, but the other side of it is it's hard to talk about black success in America 
without white mentors. So then the question becomes, how do you produce these black folk with self-confidence and self-respect who can go into white supremacist institutions, relate to white mentors in such a way that they flower and flourish, and those white mentors may have to go against certain racist sensibilities, but I don't know of a, of a highly black successful person in America who's in, let's say, the academy who didn't have white mentors. Yeah, I mean, you, you have to be able to connect, relate, and then break loose ego-like in terms of finding your own voice, but that requires a certain kind of skill and a certain kind of self-confidence, certain kind of self-respect, and a certain way of navigating and negotiating a space that for the most part was not designed for you. So Th I, does that I make think sense? That When the racism hits you. No, no, when, if you get a C on a paper, yeah. understanding you got the C on the paper and not calling the guy racist, you know, that's also Absolutely. one of the things that we do. You know, that's it's right. like, well, that's the guy's right. racist. But you know what was also valuable to me, and I was thinking about this, like going to the black barbershop, and you couldn't get an appointment, so if you went in on a Saturday with your, you just sat there all day, right? And I learned so much having them sit around talking about honkies and crackers and stuff, and, and cracking up. They would do the critique. And at first it made me nervous. I remember as a little kid, they were, because I always went to integrated schools, because schools integrated in 1955 in my county, oddly enough, in the hills of West Virginia. But they would say stuff, and I would learn watching them, and it was that critique which was also as important as role model. I mean, positive, you know, role models that you could aspire and grow up to be. But I think the important thing in those barbershops, the critique was not done in the spirit of imitation and emulation. Oh, right. It no, was no. done by looking down. Oh, my God, they got some work to do. They got some growing up to do. They got some maturing to do no. in that black context. That's part of self, black self-respect, too. Yeah, absolutely. And part of black self-confidence, too. So when you went into a, a, a context, you looked at folk not trying to imitate and emulate, assimilate, but rather take your stand based on your tradition that has produced you and still be able to negotiate in such a way that you learn from others. I call it the people who would never, ever switch the channel when Amos and Andy was on. And if you told them Amos and Andy, they would tell you, kiss their raises behind. You know what I mean? <laughs> they knew what they liked, and what they liked was just the way it is. One of the things I want the fellows to remember is that you were at a, a colloquium with William Julius Wilson and Cornell West. That's what I'm talking about. Listen to Jackie Rivers. Give it up for Jackie Rivers. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.